you know, as we can, we, we do, uh, you know, it's been a strange year, but uh, in a lot of aspects and, uh, and things, it's been a good year. Uh, so, you know, we continue to just lift up the Lord for sure and uh, praise Him for His, uh, His many blessings um, that he, he, he bestows upon us. We, uh, in Hosea chapter 6, we kind of finishing up uh, verse number 3, and it, it says, uh, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. Uh, His going forth is prepared as the morning. And He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. We talked about this rain, this, uh, these two different rains and, and how they had an effect on the land there in Israel. And as we uh, continue to, to look at these things, we, we have to realize that you know we can either prepare our lives and the lives that we come in contact with to receive His reign, or all we can do is gripe or complain because we ain't getting it. But it's not going to do us any good if we're not prepared to receive it when it comes. So, you know, we need to be prepared to receive it when it does come. And, uh, you know, we can turn around and do a, uh, a lot of things, but if we're not prepared when God decides to do what uh, uh, He wants to do and how He wants to do it, then, you know, what, what are, we li- are, are we really doing? Uh, it's not going to do us any good. Uh, you know, we can sit and complain all, all we want uh, that we're not getting any rain or we got too much rain or whatever the case may be. But we, we, the whole matter is, is to be prepared for the rain. Uh, and in many aspects, you know, that's what we have to do. We have to be prepared for it. Uh, you know, as we open... Uh, this next bit of Scripture from verses 4 through 11, uh, we find the Lord making a similar statement unto His people. They've been faithless in their faith and they've been fickle in their fever- uh, fervency and dedication to the Lord. The Lord says, you know, what am I going to do with you? And by the way, He is asking the same question about us. Uh, you know, are, are we, perhaps at times, are we a, a fickle Christian? And the, this is the topic that it seems like this uh, section is, is talking about is the... the uh, the fallacy of fickleness, of the lack of steadfastness, consistency, stability, and the tendency to be constantly changing one's mind about living for Christ. You know, Paul describes those things as as being uh, taken in the wind. You know, whichever way the wind blows, that tends to be the way we go. You know, we look at a lot of people and... uh, Especially those folks that, uh, and I'm sure that we probably all know some, that they, they love to ride the top of that fence. And they'll fall off on whichever side is convenient for the moment. And then they climb right back up and keep straddling that fence. And, 
until they come to another opportunity and then they'll fall off on whichever side is convenient. Uh, it seems like uh, in the political realm of things, our politicians today tend to be just like that. You know, they're, they'll, they'll, they'll walk that fence and it just depends upon who they're talking to to which side they're going to fall off on of what they believe or what they state or whatever. And, you know, it, it boils down to the point, and I think the Lord is about is, is ready. He just wants Israel to make a decision. You know? Just make a decision. Uh, we can look back and we can even figure... Uh, back in uh, chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. And we see the church at Laodicea. You know, the Bible tells us that they were neither hot nor cold. But they were lukewarm. They were fit straddlers. They were fickle in what they believed or they didn't believe or what they stood for or, or didn't stand for. It just depends upon the time, the moment, what mood strikes them to how they are. Well, you know, God doesn't want that. He says there in Revelation 3 that He would either have them be either hot or cold. One or the other. He could take that a lot more than He could them being lukewarm. Because when they're lukewarm, all they do is make the Lord sick to His stomach. And you know, at times, uh, that's kind of the way it is. When we're fickle with our, our uh, steadfastness, our, our consistency, our stability, our tendency to be, uh, uh, whether we're constantly just changing our minds one way or the other or the other and back again, I believe all that makes the Lord sick to His stomach. He'd rather have us be one way or the other. He'd rather have Israel be the same way here. You know, the chapter is very relevant today because many Christians in our world today, in our time frame, are fickle about their dedication to Christ and to the local church. May the you know may some of the principles that are shared in, in the in the section that we're going with help us to be firm. And may may we be able to see and to go the way that the Lord would have us to go uh, today. So, we find uh, the complaint about inconsistency and instability. Look at verse 4. It says, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? What, can, what shall I do with you? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. So basically, he, he, you know, he's the Lord as he's speaking in and through Hosea. He's talking to uh, Ephraim. He's talking to Judah. He's talking to the northern and the southern uh, kingdoms and things. And he's he's asking. He says, "What am I going to do with you?" You know, we look at our kids sometimes, maybe when they were growing up, and maybe we had the same thoughts. You know, Ben, I try to tell you what to do, how you're supposed to be doing things, and why, and yet you do this, that, or the other. What am I going to do with you? You know, sometimes we don't know which way to go to, how, to help them or to correct them or what. And, you know, we're sitting up here and, you know, we have to realize that our lack of dedication and unfaithfulness, it bothers the Lord. It may not tend to bother us any, but it bothers the Lord. You know, when, when we get up and we turn around and we say, well, you know, I don't, I don't really think that... Uh, you know, I'm a little bit tired at this point. I don't think I'm going to go to church and roll over. It ain't because you can't go. It's not because there's something wrong with you that's keeping you from going. It's because you don't go. And that bothers the Lord. 
Now being sick or something like that, that's one thing. But when you can and you don't, or you could and you won't, that bothers the Lord. And that's what he, he, he's getting at here in verse 4. You know, it's evident from the verse. The people were fickle. Their goodness, their love, or their faithfulness was like the morning cloud that takes away or that fades away before the rising sun. Or like the early dew which is speedily evaporated by the morning heat. You know, when they were faithful, it was beautiful. It was like diamond drops of dew reflecting the sunlight in the morning. Their faithfulness was like fireworks on the 4th of July that exploded in beauty but are quickly diminished. They were not responsible. They weren't reliable in their dedication to God. Ephraim and Judah had enough goodness in them to disallow their total rejection of God. And yet, they had too much evil in them to avoid God's chastisement and to receive His blessings. They could have, but they didn't. You know, and there's nothing stopping them except for them. Their own hearts is what stopped them from coming back to the Lord. You know, speaking after the manner of men, the justice and the mercy of God seemed puzzled how to act toward them. He didn't really... God. We, we get the idea here, God really... He, he's sitting there and He's scratching His head maybe. Wondering. What he's going to do with them? They're here one minute and they're gone the next. You know, they're faithful one second and then they're the not. When the justice of God was about to destroy them for their iniquity, it was prevented by their repentance and their contrition. When God's mercy was about to be poured upon them, it was prevented by their fickleness and relapse. You know, every time when they got bad that God wanted to do something, then all of a sudden they would they tend to take those little baby steps and come back again. And it would put off God. But then, uh, and then when He was just, when He would come to the moments when He was getting ready to pour out blessings, to send the rain of His blessings upon them, then they would tend to turn and walk away. God didn't know what to do. He, he, he didn't have an idea of what He should do here. Not that God was dumb or, or anything like that. I'm not saying that. It's just they put Him in this predicament. You know, one day they were one way, one day they were the next. Of course, their days ended up being perhaps years and, and, and those things. Uh, when God's mercy uh, was about to be poured out, their inconsistencies would then show up. And they would induce the just and the merciful God to, to exclaim, Oh, Ephraim! What shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? Is the Lord asking the same questions about us at times? Is he, is, he, is he seeking the same thing, the same answers about you and I and about the church today? What am I going to do with y'all? And I believe some of the things that... and, and when I reference the church, I mean, I, 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 I reference church in general. Okay, I mean, there are a lot of things that the church in general today is doing that leaves God going, scratching His head, wondering, what am I going to do with you? They turn around and, and they accept 
same-sex marriage. They turn around and they they accept abortion. They turn around and they and they a, a, accept uh, all of these different things. You know, just like it's not a big deal. And yet, even when it goes direct violation of God's word. Now, many people will tell you today. Because I've had it told me, well, you know, we're in the New Testament. We're in the new grace. Well, let me tell you something. The new grace of God is always based on the old grace of God. The New Testament that Jesus spoke in and lived in was all based on the Old Testament. So we have to realize these type of things here. Uh, you know, he he could be asking the same things about us. Are we are we fickle? Is the church church fickle in their faith today? Some folks get are frustrated because they are this type of way, and why? Some of the reasons why Christians are fickle in their faith and their fervency for the Lord Jesus. I mean, there there are things that are out there that cause people to be this way. There there are some things that cause a believer to be fickle and unstable in their Christian life. And the same things that cause a Christian to be that way today were the same things that caused the Christians to be that way in Hosea's day. Sin doesn't change. Maybe the transmission or the technology of it. But the same principles of sin today are the same principles of sin as it was yesterday as it will be tomorrow. We look. You know, they uh, some of the things that, that, that get us today that got Ephraim and Judah in this day Deception. False doctrine. And lies have led many a Christian astray to the point where they are totally ineffective for Christ. They were the same way. They were worshiping other gods. They were worshiping uh, and dealing with other nations that they shouldn't even, uh, according to Scripture, be, be dealing with. And yet they were. Deception. Um, a development that's incomplete. Spiritual immaturity and ignorance of the Word of God can create fickleness and instability. God has a way of getting our attention with trials to fling that fickleness out of our lives and to develop obedience. I mean, boy, when we look and we think about de development that's uh, incomplete when in the, in this day in Hosea's day and the days before and the, and the times before we look man they would set up memorials they would set up uh, altars to the great things that God did for them and they set them up for one purpose so that when the generations that are coming up behind them when they would come up and say hey what's this here for then they could tell, tell them about the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God and how He acted on their behalf. But all those things kind of got lost in the, in the works somewhere. They weren't still telling their people about God because they're too busy trying to serve other gods idols and things. They had a double-mindedness and a lack of decisiveness can make a Christian fickle. Some Christians are fickle about their faith because they've not made up their minds. They've not proposed in their hearts to be and to do what God wants them to do. 
people in Hosea's day, they didn't set their, their eyes on the Lord God of Israel. They set their eyes on whatever God had to come around if He could benefit them. Same as we do today. There are a lot of gods that people put before the Lord Jesus. They'll put their jobs, they put money, they put uh, even their health, uh, all kinds of things. That they'll put on their rung of pro their ladder of priorities above Jesus. We must make up our minds whom we're going to serve. We can't we we can't just sit up here and and just fall off on whichever side and serve this for a moment and serve that for a moment. Because as we said last time, if you don't believe in 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 to have faith in something, you'll fall for anything. And that's what the world is doing today. To, to not only our generation, but the generations behind us that are coming up. The world is fooling our children and our grandchildren. They're leading them astray. And one, you know why they, 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 the world's leading our kids and our grandkids astray? Because their parents and their grandparents don't take a stand to tell them what's right, what's wrong, what God says. Because half of them don't know. Daniel and Paul both had a purpose in living for God. They both had spiritual goals. They were uh, used of God because of their attitudes. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, he said, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile him. Philippians 3, verse 14. Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That was his goal in life. Man, it wasn't, to, it wasn't to, to, uh, for power and, and, and make a lot of money and all this other stuff. Man, he cared about serving Jesus. Uh, another thing that caused the Ephraim and Judah to stray, that causes us to stray, is displeasure and disgust with the Scripture, with God's Word. And folks, if you have a displeasure and a disgust with God's Word, guess what? You have a displeasure and a disgust with God. People get mad. They get offended at the preaching of God's Word. Fickleness and instability are always in the shadows. This is what happened to those who followed Jesus and then were offended by His preaching. Man, they love to follow to see the show. What's He going to do next? What kind of miracles is He going to perform next? Everywhere he went, there were hordes of people that followed him. But when he got to preaching, there were a lot of them that left him because they couldn't take what he said. John 6, in verse 66, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And if you notice, if you'll notice the chapter and the verse 6, 6, 6. Man, that, you know, it, it, it's no coincidence. 
<laughs> but when people get to doing these things, you know, they just, they don't like what God's Word says. The trouble is, it's not really disgust. It's conviction that gets upon a person. You know, and, and when that conviction comes, you got one or two things to do with it. You can either let it affect your life so that you can turn from perhaps something, or maybe it's it, it gets you to where that conviction is speaking to your heart about something that perhaps you need to be doing that you're not doing. Or maybe you're doing something that you don't need to be doing and you don't need to do it. But they'll turn around and instead of, of, of saying, well, you know, that conviction convicted my heart. It convicted my spirit. It, 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 God's Word spoke to me today. Instead, they get bent out about it. Man, He's preaching right to me this morning. Well, if you think that, probably is. Because, I mean, you know, God may have been speaking to you. Distractions tend to, to take a person. It took Ephraim and it took Judah away from God. It distracted them. It caused them to be fickle. You know, when a person's heart is turned away from the Lord, he's facing the wrong direction. The directions of Satan can make a person fickle and unstable. When the love for the Lord fades for a love for something else, you will be fickle in your faith. Satan can use all kinds of things to distract us, to get our eyes off of God. That's what Satan did here. They'll, they'll believe... You know, we believe here in the book of Hosea, I mean, and with Ephraim and Judah that these people were turning around and they were doing, you know, they thought they were doing best, but man, this is nothing more than Satan leading, leading them astray. They knew what was what. They didn't pay attention to They had a desertion and a, a disregard for the Lord. You know, the Christian life is a constant battle of wills. It's either our will or His will. One of them is going to prevail. When we become willful and reject what God has to say, we become fickle in our faith. Because then we want to hunt and peck what we want to believe and what we want to accept and what we don't want to accept and what we don't want to believe. There are folks out there today that they'll turn around and they'll, they'll claim, boy, i got a hard problem with this virgin birth thing that you talk about in, in, at Christmas and, and in and through the book of, uh, of Matthew and, and Mark or Matthew and Luke. I got a hard problem with that because I just can't seem to, to accept that fact. Because science said, hey, look, I don't care what science said. All I know is back on when you get to looking in those things, it also says that God can do anything. And He can do anything. He can sure cause a virgin to conceive. But they got a disregard. For God's work. Many find out that when they get what they want, they're discouraged to find out it's not what they wanted at all. Man, I, I know a lot of people that, that sit around and they say, boy, I wish I was a millionaire. But you know, they don't want none of the problems that goes along with being a millionaire. There's a lot of things, a lot of problems that go along with being a millionaire. Taxes. <laughs> People. You know, and eventually if you're not careful, and, and the world tells you you can't do it, but you can. I mean, you can end up having nothing, 
to being a millionaire like overnight. And if you're not careful, you can be right back to having nothing again. Real quick like. Difficulty. Man, when, when Ephraim and Judah, when they came in to difficulties in their life, when the trials and, and those things come, man, they didn't trust God and His Word about anything. But what they did, they, they, tended, they turned to other nations. And they turned to their heathen gods and idols and all that stuff for direction. I'm sorry. But I just can't see getting direction from an idol. Especially because when you stop and consider every idol out there from the beginning of time to the end of, of the age as we know it, idols all have one major thing in common. They're all man-made. How can you put your trust into a God that's made with the hands of man? It just don't work. You know, you, you carve something up. Ah, here's my idol. Yeah. Man, if you can make it, it can surely be destroyed. It won't stand the test of time. Man, how many... I can tell you right now, there's not one of us in this room that our cars out here are going to make it to... 21 the year 2100 that's you know you're talking what 79 years from now not a one of these cars is going to make it now we may still find them some scrapyard somewhere but they're going to rust the engine's going to give out the transmission's going to give out it's going to lock up it's going to be gone it's not going to last. But you know, the thing about God is that He can last. Man, He's been here from the beginning of time as we know it, but before that, because God was. I mean, He's the grand creator of everything. And He's here today and He'll be here way past you and me. We need to realize that our difficulties test the strength of our faith. Our problems that we go through are not just problems, but they test the strength of our faith. When something is big enough that we don't know how we're going to get through it. We don't know how we're going to do it. It will test our faith. If we continue to run from difficulties, we will only find more of them littered in our path until we learn the lessons that they teach. When we learn their lessons, they don't seem as difficult anymore. There are two ways in meeting our difficulties. We can alter the difficulties or we can alter ourselves. Many times God allows difficulties in our lives in order to change us, to help us mature. James 1 
In verses 3 and 4 it says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. See, but every time that something come up for them with Ephraim and Judah, they always wanted to try to search out some answer for themselves. Same as mankind today. Same as us today. A lot of times, man, we don't, we don't rely, we don't trust, we don't put our faith in God. We, we try to dig our way out of, the, out of whatever our trouble is ourselves. And half the time when we try to dig ourselves out, all we end up doing is digging a deeper hole for ourselves. And there are other things. You know, a degenerate crowd. Man, some of the folks that Ephraim and Judah were running with. Right? Some of these other nations, these heathen people, they're heathen gods and things. Man, they, those are the type of people that their mom and daddy probably warned them about. You know? You don't be dealing with those folks. The wrong crowd can have a big influence for bad in a person's life. You know, you get to running with the wrong people, you'll end up doing some of the wrong things. Not intentionally, but eventually, those things will all catch up with you. And you may end up being a wrong person in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with wrong people. But you'll be in you'll be just as much in trouble as they. That's what happened with Ephraim and Jude. Doubt and discouragement. Man, when when they're tough, when their going got tough, the tough didn't get going. They just began to get discouraged. And they get into doubt. Oh, man, you want me to... Uh, Hosea telling me that I need to turn back to God. What God going to do for me? He ain't never done nothing for me so far. And those type of people are the type of people that they don't look back. And they don't see God where God acted in their lives. All they can see is where they are right now. person begins to doubt God, the door is open for Satan to make his move. We saw that in the Garden of Eden with Eve. Surely you won't die. God's Word said what? <laughs> Surely you will. Doubt. Satan can get a person to doubt or get a people to doubt God. He's got a foot in that door of their lives. Ephraim and Judah, they doubted God. If they didn't ever doubt God, they wouldn't have never turned from Him and to go in search of other gods and in search of other people. They would have relied on God. Disorganization, discrepancy, disarray, Chaos will cause a person to go away from God. Cause them to be fickle in their faith. Man, you look at the chaos that we've gone through for a year. Well, almost a year. Ten months going on the 11th. And I don't really see no end, end of it in sight. Not right now. But you know, we can either be caught up in this chaos and give over and give in to it, or we can just trust God to bring us through the chaos to the other side. And then we find a delicate foundation for life. When we build our life upon self, sinful living upon the fading things of this world, then the foundation 
of your life is weak. It's not strong. Because all those things are only temporary. The Bible tells us. Wood, hay, and stone. They won't stand the test. And our foundation won't be strong. The weakness of our life creates fickleness, instability, especially in our emotions and our spiritual growth. The wise person will ground his life in Jesus and center his life around the Lord. The Lord puts high premium upon disobedience, upon obedience and faithfulness. We're challenged to be faithful, not fickle in our faith. You know, that's the reason why they had so many problems trying, just trying to understand we find them for two chapters now going on in, into this third one. They're trying to figure out what's God doing? How come God is, is doing this way for us? Why, is he, why, are we, why are we in the shape we're in? How come God is doing this or God is doing that? Trouble is, is that they don't stop to realize that it ain't God doing anything. They put themselves exactly where they are. They just didn't trust God enough. So they didn't end up where they are. Anyway. You know, it, it, it seems like the more I study this book, the more that I, I that we can get into God's Word, we find that the more that we, we are in it, the more pertinent it is for today. And the only thing about it is, a hundred years from now, if we're all still here, well, it, it, you know, if the world's still in existence a hundred years from now, the things of this blessed old book will still be pertinent for the day. Here we are. First Wednesday of the month. We always pray in the month. And, uh, you know, I hope and pray that uh, people that, that, that you've already prayed about the year. Uh, but anyway, as we go through, we're going to, to, uh, to just uh, pray in the month. And pray in a brand new year. And, uh, you know, if you feel like praying, you can and, and things. And uh, we'll start and then I'll close this out at the end and, and things. And, uh, you know, we just need to be trusting in the Lord, especially here in 2021. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to ask the Lord if you'll start. And then if you feel like praying, you know, we all know how it works.
Lord, we do come once again, Lord, as we we step out of 2020, and Lord, we step right into 2021. Lord, uh, it seems like uh, uh, the same uh, confusion and chaos seems to be about us, Lord, and and yet, Lord, I do thank you for being the God and the Lord that you are, Lord, that we can we might step out of one situation and into another just based upon the date of a calendar and yet Lord we can realize that you're always right with us you're always walking just right beside us Lord Lord we, we pray that 2021 would be a, a a lot better year Lord not only for our country but Lord for your church and Lord that there would would be those that Lord would would just have a brand new uh, uh, reason within their hearts, Lord, just to be able to stand fast and sure in your hope, Lord. Lord, just uh, be sure and, and remember, Lord, the the prayer requests that we listed up, and Lord, that in each and every one of those circumstances, Lord, we we just ask that your will be done. And Lord, that whatever and however you act in, in those in each of those circumstances, Lord, that it would be just as you would have it to be. And Lord, we'll trust that and we'll take that, Lord. Lord, just continue to uh, watch out over us, lead, guide, and direct us, Lord, as only you can. Lord, I pray for those that uh, just have, seem to to have lost. Lord, uh, the want to come and to uh, fellowship with and assemble themselves with like believers, Lord, uh, Lord, I pray for them that you would strengthen up their hearts, Lord, that they could come back and get back into your house, Lord, and Lord, that they would be better for it. Lord, just uh, be with us now. Take us from this place this evening, Lord. Let us reach and uh, leave here and and go our separate ways. And and Lord, that you would help us to just stay safe and reach our homes, Lord, in in a in a, a manner worthy of to you. Lord, we'll give you praise, honor, and glory for all that you've done, the things you're doing, Lord. And Lord, we know the things that according to Your blessed Word that You are going to do for us, Lord, we give You praise, honor, and glory for it way in advance of all those things. Lord, just help us to be those folks that You would have us to be. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.